Part 1. You will hear two friends, Nancy and Fiona, catching up with each other. First, you will have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Hello, Fiona. I haven't seen you for ages. Hi, Nancy. It must be two years, I think. Has it been that long? It seems like yesterday that we were regularly catching up with each other, on Friday mornings at that cafe around the corner from you. Yes, I remember our chats at Cafe Bellissimo over a nice hot coffee and cake. Do you still work part-time or are you busier now? Well, actually, since I saw you last, I've had a baby girl who's with her grandmother at the moment. So I'm free to pay bills and do grocery shopping. What about yourself? What are you up to these days? Well, actually, I've started my own business, so I'm pretty busy. I'd call it full-time work myself, although the hours are very flexible. Wow, that sounds really fascinating. What sort of business is it? Well, we were initially going to open a shop, but we thought it would be easier to sell our product online. And a market stall would have been too hard to manage. We also thought it would be a great idea to sell, not just in Perth, but all over Australia as well. So what do you sell? We're selling children's costumes from around the world. Interesting. How did you come up with the idea? As you know, Perth is such a multicultural society. At my children's school, there are so many immigrant children. Many of the families find it difficult to get traditional things from their culture, including clothes for special celebrations. With our extensive business travelling over the years, we have made numerous contacts in many countries. To look at questions 7 to 10. Now answer questions 7 to 10. So how many countries' costumes do you sell? At the moment, I have a good range of countries. I have access to 10 from Africa and similarly from Asia with 10 nationalities. I have slightly more from the Americas with 13 and more again from Europe with 25. Unfortunately, I only have six for the Pacific region, but I'm expanding all the time. When do you find time to run your business? Well, that's the problem at the moment. I have so many things to organise, but I don't have enough time to do everything. Do you see an accountant or do you do your tax yourself? I get all of my receipts and expenses together, but then I go to an accountant who fills in my tax return as it takes me too much time. What about your website? You said that your company's growing all the time. Yes, it's true that my website continually needs to be updated, but it only takes me a short time each week to do it. So that is one area I can manage myself. Do you advertise your business anywhere? Where do your customers come from? It's interesting you should ask. Most of my business is word of mouth, but I do hand out a lot of business cards. I get them done by the local printer, although I must admit that they are rather plain. I need to add a little colour when I get time to redesign them in the future. Well, it's been great catching up with you and finding out all about your business. I'm very interested in looking at your website when I get home. Here's my business card so that you can email me for our next get-together. Don't bother about a babysitter next time. Bring your daughter with you as I'd love to meet her. That sounds like a great idea. See you soon. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. The Overseas Students Club is organising a tour of the city to help new students to find their way around. 
you will hear the tour guide giving them a talk about what will happen the next day and some instructions as to what to do. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you to our city. I hope that you will have an interesting and valuable experience with us. As you know, we're going on a tour tomorrow to show you some of the sites and the places of interest. So I would like to give you some instructions and some information to prepare you for tomorrow. It is important that we all meet at the same place at the same time. You should all be able to get into the centre of the city by train or bus from your homestay. We want to start our tour at 10am, so you'll have to make sure that you leave home around 9.15 in time to arrive for us to start the tour at 10. If you are late, we will not be able to wait more than a few minutes, so I suggest that you take your mobile phone and have my number just in case. My number is 0482 557369. I will just repeat that so you can get it. 0482 557369. 7369. You can see Ms Parker after the talk if you do not have her number and she will be happy to provide it. It's good to have both our numbers just in case. Oh and another thing, it is better to buy a one-way ticket because the tour will last for three hours and a return ticket lasts only for two hours. Before the final part of the talk, to look at questions 16 to 20. Now answer questions 16 to 20. Now, we are meeting at the Town Hall. You should be able to make your way there from the bus or train stations, which are both in Flinders Street. It is only a short walk from both stations. If you're coming to the city by train, the Town Hall is straight ahead of you when you exit the station. Just walk up Collins Street and you will see it on the left after the traffic lights. If you come in by bus, you will need to turn right at the exit, then take the first street left, which is Collins Street. You will see the Town Hall on your maps. So if you have your maps with you, it's a good idea to mark the route now. Now, there will probably be quite a few people around in the city when you arrive, so it is important that we can find each other. Please don't go inside the building. We should all meet outside on the steps of the town hall to make sure we don't miss anyone. From there, we will be visiting a few places of interest. We will make our way to the library, which is in the same street. It will take us about 10 minutes on foot. It is a good library for students. So we'll be giving you about 20 minutes to have a look around at the facilities. That probably won't be enough time for all of you to join the library, so you'll have to come back at another time to do that. It might be a good idea to pick up a membership form before you leave. From the library, we will turn right into William Street, where you'll see a cinema on the left. This is popular with the students, and it shows some interesting art house movies. On the way, you might want to check out what is showing there at the moment. Diagonally opposite the cinema is the art gallery. There will be time, about 15 minutes, for a quick look at some of the exhibits. You will probably want to return by yourself for a longer visit another time. From there, we will walk up to the main street, which is Wellington Street, on your maps. It's around the next corner from the art gallery, and will show you some cheap but excellent restaurants, as well as cafes and bars, which I'm sure you will find useful in your free time. They are frequented by many of the students here, so I recommend that you come back later to sample the food and atmosphere. It is a good way to meet some of the local students as well. Well, I said that it would take about three hours. This is because we will be stopping at the park for a picnic lunch. The park is a 15 minute walk along the main street from the restaurant area. We will be supplying the lunch for everyone, so you won't need to bring anything. However, you will need to bring or buy your own drinks. If anyone has any special dietary requirements, please see me or Ms Parker after this talk. Oh. 
And please make sure that you wear some comfortable clothes. Sensible walking shoes are advisable, as you will be doing quite a lot of walking. It is also a good idea to bring some sunscreen and a hat, as the sun can be quite strong at this time of the year. Finally, although the tour is free, you might want to bring some extra money with you for drinks or souvenirs. Well, I hope you all enjoy the tour and get to know each other. I'm sure we will have a great day. Now, anyone who needs to see me? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student, Sandra, talking to a student advisor about her approaching exam. First, you will have half a minute to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 21 to 30. I've got an exam tomorrow and I'm worried about how it will go. Do you have any tips? I think I'm well prepared. I've done all the revision and I've been practicing lots of exam questions, but I still feel nervous about the exam itself. I know what you mean, but if you're well prepared, you should be fine. You just need to stay calm and keep reminding yourself that you are prepared. That's easy to say, but in an exam, unexpected things happen. Well, there are a few things that I found helpful. You don't want to run out of energy or feel sleepy during the exam, so make sure you eat something beforehand. Also, it's a good idea to leave home early to allow for any traffic jams or parking problems. You don't want to arrive late or even worse, miss the exam altogether. That's good advice. But if I get there too early, I might start getting nervous while I'm waiting. That can happen, especially if you start talking to others about the exam. You know how they can start saying things like, there's bound to be a question on such and such, or most people failed this subject last year. I found that this kind of talk can just make you panic. So if you arrive very early, read through your notes while you are waiting. I think you'll find it helps you to stay calm. OK. What about during the exam? I keep thinking about the things that can go wrong. Well, I think the most important piece of advice would be to read the instructions and questions carefully. Before the final part of the talk, look at questions. Make sure you know how many questions and sections there are so that you don't miss any. Then make sure you know how you're expected to answer them. Yeah, it would be terrible to fail because I missed a whole question or section. That's right. Timing is also important. You don't want to miss a question because you run out of time either. Allocate a time for each question and stick to it. And because timing is vital during an exam, I always wear a watch just in case there isn't a clock in the exam room. It helps to keep you on track. Also, if you see that time is running out, briefly answer or just guess the answer to as many of the questions as you can. Yes, especially for multiple choice questions. I could be lucky and select the correct one. True. Even if you don't know the answer, you could still gain valuable marks by guessing. Another important thing is to write the number of words required for an essay question. 
If your essay is too long or too short, you could lose a lot of marks. You could also waste a lot of time. And I have seen students do badly because they spent too much time on one essay, then didn't have enough time left to complete another one. So look to see how many marks are allocated for each essay and divide your time accordingly. Thanks. Look, this is all terrific advice, but what if I suddenly start to panic or get a memory block in the middle of the exam? Well, you have to think positively. You know you are prepared and you know that you can pass. As soon as you feel yourself starting to get panicky, relax and take slow, deep breaths. You should allow yourself to take a few seconds to stretch your arms, legs, neck and back occasionally too. I found that this helps. It can also be useful if you start to feel physically tired during the exam. Yes, I can see how that could help. I'm feeling more relaxed as we speak. Good. Oh, and one more thing. It's not a good idea to leave the room before the time is up, even if you have finished all the questions. Spelling, grammar and punctuation mistakes can make a difference to your marks. So try to leave some time at the end for checking your answers. I don't think I'll be leaving early somehow. Look, you've been really helpful. I'm very grateful. Not at all. You're welcome. Just remember that you've worked hard on your preparation and you are familiar with the exam. Think positively and stay calm. I'm sure you will do well. Good luck for tomorrow. Thank you very much. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk by a financial advisor about debt. First, you will have half a minute to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to today's public lecture on the topic of personal debt. I'm Ray Goodman from the Community Debt Centre and I'd like to present to you today the second part of our three lecture series. Today we're going to look at how debt affects our lives. Debt is nothing new. It's found throughout human history and in every society. Many people know what it feels like to be in debt. Those of you who have bought a house will probably have a mortgage. Perhaps you have borrowed money from family or friends or got a loan for a car. Debt can sometimes be a way of juggling financial commitments and of paying in advance for things that you really need. For everyday living, you might not earn enough money from your job to pay for all the things that you need. You may require a little extra money in the form of credit cards. But debt has a darker side. Imagine how you would feel if you were deeply in debt and unable to repay what you owed. The consequences for many people can be disastrous. Today, people in the richer countries of the world live in a society where credit is easily accessible. Banks, building societies and credit card companies often encourage people to take out loans. They then make money by charging interest. For very low income earners, borrowing from a bank can be impossible. Instead, they are forced to take out a much higher interest loan from a private lender. They soon find that, despite cutting back on many essentials, they are unable to keep up with these repayments. They are forced to take out another loan and find themselves plunging deeper and deeper into debt. People can find themselves with growing debts if they are unable to repay interest. 
This may be because of a sudden life-changing event, such as a business failure or losing a job. But for many households, debt is a means of survival. Before the final part of the talk, look at questions. In developing countries, people borrow a tiny sum of money from a local landowner, for example, to pay for medical treatment. They agree that a child would work as a full-time servant to repay the debt, and that child becomes a bonded labourer. But since they are never paid, there is no hope of clearing the debt. Their life is ruled by fear. With no money, education or experience of life, it is impossible for them to escape. Today, debt bondage is a major form of slavery. As you can see, debt affects everyone all over the world to varying degrees. I hope the information I have presented to you today will make you think twice about getting into spiralling debt. Of course, if you are already finding yourself in financial difficulties, please make an appointment to see one of our helpful staff members after this talk. Thank you. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Yeah.